And am I on? I want to make sure everybody can hear me. We're good? All right. Good to see you all this morning. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew, no, Mark chapter 6. To Mark chapter 6. And while you're doing that, I want to say it is a pleasure to be here this morning with you. I look forward to being with you for the next uh, several Sundays in the month of September. And normally, uh, in my position as pastor, typically, uh, I would be welcoming people that I don't recognize and saying, well, if you're a guest and I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you. But I'm the guest uh, and I haven't met many of you. I've met some of you this morning already. So again, I would love to meet you. Um, after the service, if we didn't get a chance to say hello beforehand, I'd love to, to meet you. Now, so that's one thing I want to say. Here's the second thing I want to say. I'm going to ask you what your name is multiple times. All right, I'm just going to put that out there up front. It'll take me a couple of times to get it down. I've got a, a, a leaky brain, and uh, so, so if I ask you again, it's not because I don't care. It's just because I just, it's just, that's just me. Yeah, I come from a long line of absent-minded people, so it's good to see you this morning. Let's pray as we get ready to look into God's Word. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your name. Father, we thank you for the fact that all around this country and all around the world, people are gathering in your name. Uh, this morning and worshiping you, Father, that, that you are at work all over the place. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you are at work here at Parkview. And we pray that you would bless this church and we pray that you would bless this morning as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning we've gathered for worship. And, and when we gather for worship, and particularly when we gather for a worship service, we have something very particular in mind that we're thinking about, right? Right? When we talk about a worship service at church, there's usually singing involved, there's preaching involved. Sometimes, depending on what tradition you come from, there may be other elements involved if you're from a liturgical tradition. But, but there is something very specific. And I've been, to, I've been to not many countries around the world, but a few other countries and worshiped in other places. And it's pretty much the same. It looks just like what we do here, different language sometimes, and maybe again there's other elements, but it's very similar to what we do here. But this morning I want to look at an unusual worship service in the New Testament, and one that doesn't really look like a worship service that we're used to. In fact, when you read this passage, you wouldn't say, oh, that's a worship service, right? But, not, see, not only is there no singing, not only is there no preaching in this passage, it's a very small group of people, but here's what's going on in that passage. Jesus is there, and there is amazement at who Jesus is, and so there is worship. And so I want us to look this morning at Mark chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 45, and this is what we read. This morning, it's a familiar story, I hope, to many of you. And if it's a familiar story, if it's not, I hope you're, you're seeing this for the first time. But if it is a familiar story, this morning, I hope that you see it in a fresh way. Look at what Mark writes in chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Now, this is a, immediately preceding this, he fed the 5,000. So he feeds the 5,000, and this is what happens right after. After he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them being battered as they rode because the wind was against them. I'm going to come back to this, but he's on a mountain. They're in the sea. There's a storm. It's at night, and yet he sees them. It's interesting. Around three in the morning, he came toward them walking on the sea and wanted to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke with them and said, Have courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded because they had not understood about the loaves. He's talking again about the, the miraculous way Jesus multiplied the loaves to feed those people. Instead, Mark writes, their hearts were hardened. Now, even though this doesn't look much like a worship service, and particularly not a worship service that we would be familiar with, it does teach us something about our worship this morning that I want us to see. So here's the big idea that I want you to kind of grasp as we look into this passage, and then we're going to kind of unpack it as we go through it. But here's the big idea. Sometimes our worship is most fervent when our needs are most evident. Sometimes our worship of Christ 
is most fervent. It means the most to us. It comes more from a place of, uh, in our hearts, when our needs are most evident. And I think Jesus allowed this scenario to unfold for that very reason, right? He allowed this to happen to get to the point that they arrived at in the end. So let's just take a few minutes and walk through this passage and see how it unfolds. First, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the setup. I want you to see the setup, which is isolation and distress. Here's the point of this passage, or here's one of the things I want you to see, that Jesus set his disciples up for what happened to them. This didn't happen by accident. Don't miss that. He sent them out there knowing what would happen to them. That seems like a cruel joke, doesn't it? That Jesus puts them in this situation where they have no idea what's going on, but he does. I want to tell you a story. Before I tell you the story, I need to let you know that my family has an unusual sense of humor. All right. And particularly my mother. Um, she, we just, it's, it, we just have a quirky sense of humor. So if you don't find this funny, I'll understand. But in our family, this was funny. So I'm a, a high schooler and, um, I needed to go to see an orthodontist to, uh, see about braces. And when I was in high school, I think it was high school, maybe early high school. At that time, uh, the only people who really got braces or were, were young children. It wasn't like everybody. Nowadays, you know, you need braces, who cares? It doesn't matter who you are, you get braces. But back then, it was kind of more of a kid's thing to get braces. And so I was really not happy that as, you know, a really smooth, cool high school kid, that I was having to go see this orthodontist to get braces. I was very put out by this, that I had to be, you know, subjected to this, this treatment. And um, so we go into the orthodontist office, and sure enough, it's, it's designed for kids, you know, and I have to be in there. And it's just, I'm very uncomfortable with this uh, because I was so cool, right? And so at one point, I, I needed to use the restroom, and I asked the, the lady at the desk, you know, where the restroom was, and she, she directed me to it. And she said, and you have to get the key. It's on the hippo's tail. I mean, that's, that's the kind of atmosphere is in there. Um, and, and I was, I was tense about it. You know how high school kids are. They're just too cool for anything. Right. And so at one point they came and they got my mom and I, and they took us into the orthodontist office. We were going to have a consult with them about whether I needed braces or what that would look like. So we take, we go into the office in the office. He had a desk behind the desk was his chair in front of the desk was another chair. My mom sat in the chair in front of the desk. There was also a, uh, examining like a dental chair in his office. So I sat in that chair. And the nurse came in and she said, now before the orthodontist comes and uh, talks with you, I want you to watch a video about braces so you just kind of get an idea what braces are all about. Fine. They put the video on. It was a tooth fairy, like a cartoon version of the tooth fairy explaining braces. And I am just, you know, this is so beneath me. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm really tense. I'm, I don't want to be there. I feel like it's an you know, indignity upon myself and all this. Well, my mother's sitting at the desk and she looks on the desk and she's looking at stuff on his desk and she picks up this thing, which is a plastic hairband, you know, that women sometimes hold their hair back, but, but it has springs on it with these little balls. So she puts it on and, and starts moving her head around and these little balls go, and this is more than I can handle. And I'm sitting there and because I know the orthodontist is going to come in in any minute. And if he comes in and finds my mom wearing these hairbands, I'm just going to melt. I'm just going to die right there on the spot. And so I'm looking at her, I'm going, mom, take, take those off, take those off. I'm, t- you know, I'm just, and so she, she, she goes, fine. She takes them off. She puts them on the desk. Now, here's what I didn't know. Where my mother was sitting, she could see out of this dentist office into another room where this orthodontist was working on someone. And he had on his head a set of these little things. So he's actually wearing them while he's working. So when he walked into the office, my mom had set me up. She had gotten me ratcheted all the way up, you know, as a young high school boy and my uncomfortableness. And when he walked in, I just lost it and started laughing at him, right? But she did that on purpose. She set me up because she knew something that I didn't know. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He sets them up because he wants to get to a certain reaction. My mom wanted me to to, you know, to, to laugh and, 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 and be uncomfortable when this guy walked in. But Jesus wanted to get them to a certain place, a certain reaction. And so he set them up. You know, we talk a lot as Christians about being in the center of God's will, as if that's all about tranquility, right? 
How, if you ask somebody, you know, they're trying to make a decision. Oh, how do you know this is God's will for your life? Well, I have a piece about it. But that doesn't really fit with this story, right? Look at this story. They, they were in the middle of God's will, and yet they were in distress. In John's gospel, when he tells the same old story, he says, not just there is there wind, but a high wind, and the sea began to churn. The point is that they were struggling because they were out in the middle of the sea. And that's exactly where Jesus wanted them to be. And imagine what they might have been thinking at this moment when they're out there. They're, they're thinking things like, I'm sure we're going to die. We're going to die. These are, these are seasoned fishermen, but they're, they're in distress. They're thinking, uh, how will we ever make it back to shore? We, we cannot row against this wind enough to get back to shore. Why did Jesus send us out here? Where is God when we need him? All of these thoughts, I'm sure, were going through their mind as this scenario unfolds. And here's my question. Have you ever had those thoughts? Have you ever been at a time in your life, a time of distress, a time of need, a time of crisis, where you're maybe thinking, my needs won't be met. I can't possibly see how God is going to meet my needs in this time. Or maybe you're thinking, it's up to me, but how can I make it happen? There's no way I can actually do what needs to happen here. Or maybe you're thinking, I was faithful to Jesus, so why am I at my place in this life? Or why am I at this place in my life? I was faithful. I did what he asked me to do. And yet here I am. Or maybe you're thinking, God has abandoned me. I, and I think if we're faithful Christians, we try not to think that consciously, right? <laughs> but we might feel that. And on a subconscious level, and maybe in the quietness of our own heart, we have this idea that has, has God abandoned me? Have you ever felt like David? Listen to what David said in Psalm 69. He said, Save me, O God, for the waters have risen to my neck. I have sunk deep in the mud, and there is no footing. I have come into deep waters, and a flood sweeps over me. I am weary from crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Listen to that language. My eyes fail looking for my God. My throat is parched. I've been, I've been, I'm so deep in this, God. I've been looking for you for so long to see how you're going to show up in this uh, that I'm beginning to lose my spiritual eyesight. See, the disciples weren't out of God's will, even though they were in distress. They weren't out of God's will. David, at that point, wasn't out of God's will and what he was going through in his life. But God allows us to go through times that we might feel alone or that we might feel overwhelmed. But here's the key. That's only how we feel. And I'm sure if Steve Pettit has been here preaching for as long as he was here preaching, that you've heard him say, our thinker and our feeler will lie to us, right? Right? How we feel, how the situation looks to our natural eyes is not necessarily the reality. So let's look at the reality. This is the second point. The reality for these disciples, even though they didn't know it, was security and salvation. The reality was security and salvation. From their viewpoint, things didn't look good. But as the reader, we can see more than they saw. Mark is writing this to us and giving us insider knowledge as to what's really going on that the disciples didn't have at the time. The text, tells, the text tells us that even though uh, that Jesus was on the land and they were out in the middle of the sea, which is a big lake, really, the Sea of Galilee, a big lake, that despite the fact that it was night, he could see them in distress. That's impossible from a human standpoint, right? Does he have like super, you know, superhero vision or something? No, that's not what's going on. He doesn't have superhero vision. He knew their need because he has divine awareness, <laughs> Jesus knew the need that they were having in their life. He knew the distress that they were in. They didn't know that he knew, but he knew. They were never outside of his care, even though he wasn't physically there. Now think about that in your life. You know, we don't have the physical presence of Jesus. And sometimes you can feel like you're alone. You know, if Jesus is standing right next to you physically, then, then maybe you can say, okay, I'm going through a tough time, but here's Jesus, he's right here. But sometimes it can feel like we're alone. 
But what this passage shows is that even though Jesus is not physically present with us, he knows our need. He is present. But more than that, more than the fact that he knows their need, he goes out to them for the purpose of saving them. In verse 48, we read that he wanted to pass by them. Now, that sounds like when we read that in English, it sounds like what he's saying is he was trying to sneak by them. He was trying to get by them without them seeing, but that's not it at all. Remember that the people who are reading Mark's gospel, their Bible is the Old Testament. So they're reading what Mark is writing in light of the Old Testament scriptures. And in the Old Testament, the term pass by was used in two very important ways. Number one, it was used when God wanted to reveal himself or to reveal something about himself to someone. You remember when Moses, when God revealed himself to Moses, he put Moses in the cleft of the rock, right? And he passed, it says he passed by Moses and he revealed his name to Moses, right? So that term is used when God wants to reveal something about himself to someone. It's also used when God wants to bring salvation to Israel in the Old Testament. The term pass through means God's bringing judgment. Exodus 12, uh, 23 says, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. So when you read pass through in the Old Testament, that's judgment. When you read pass by, that is salvation. God in the, in the book of Ezekiel is talking to the people of Israel and he's telling them, in very metaphorical language, that uh, he, when he chose Israel to be his special people, it wasn't because of how great they were. In fact, he says they were like a newborn that had been born and then just as a newborn left to, to die of exposure. And he said, I came across you and there you were, this baby still in your blood, still in all of the ambiotic fluid and everything. And this is what he says, I don't have it in your notes, but this is what he said in Ezekiel 16:8. Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at a time for love, and I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you would become mine, declares the Lord Almighty. So this term, pass by, when we read it in our culture, doesn't mean a whole lot. When they read it, it meant something very different. Jesus is not trying to sneak by. He goes out to provide salvation, listen, so that they will see him for who he is. Remember, pass by in the Old Testament, God wants to reveal something about himself and God wants to provide salvation. And Jesus is doing both things here. When it says he wanted to pass by, he wanted to save them and therefore reveal something true about himself. So think about your own world and the times of distress that you've experienced in your own life. They are not times of isolation from God. They are not times of isolation from God. He sees your need. And more importantly, He wants to reveal something of Himself to you through that need that you have in your life. Listen, there's nothing more hopeless than just thinking that life is random and meaningless. And there's no purpose and there's no rhyme or reason to the things that happen to us. In God's sovereign grace, even what Satan means for our destruction, God means for our glory. He will reveal himself in those times. But you know what? Seeing God in the middle of all of this is not always our first reaction, is it? I mean, even, even when you know some things to be true, kind of on an intellectual level, that's not always our first reaction. Oh, I'm in the middle of this distress. I feel alone and abandoned. But you know what? I am learning something about God. That's not always where we first go. So look at the reaction of the, of the disciples. It was fear and confusion. As Jesus, not, not when they're in the boat, you know, rowing against the wind, but as Jesus comes to them, as he's in the middle of revealing something about himself, as he's in the middle of saving them, what is their reaction? Fear and confusion. They're freaked out. Look at verse 49. When they saw him walking on the sea, they said, oh, it's Jesus, we're saved. <laughs> no, that's not what they said, right? Jesus was actively coming to them in distress, and they didn't get it. Why is that? Why is that? You know, we're hard on the disciples sometimes because they just seem like knuckleheads. You're like, come on, if I was there, I would have, no, we would have all done the same thing that they did. Why is it they didn't get it? I think there's several reasons. One is they're in distress, and sometimes that clouds our ability to see what's right in front of us. 
you're in enough distress emotionally or physically or financially or whatever it might be, sometimes that clouds our vision. We don't see things well. Sometimes we miss what God is doing because we're overwhelmed by our problem. That's a very human response. Here's another reason I think maybe they missed it. They were influenced by their culture. What did they say when they saw Jesus? They, they, they thought it was a ghost. Why? Why would they come up with that? Well, clearly that's something of a cultural idea that they had. And so they tapped into what their culture would say. And that was their conclusion. Sometimes we tend to interpret things based on how our culture has trained us to think. And listen, all of us have been trained in some way to think by our culture. That's why Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, because we are naturally conformed to the way our world thinks. And I think that's what's happening here. In our world, think about somebody who's maybe a bad guy, maybe a real jerk. And at some point in his life, something really bad happens to him. And a lot of people in our culture would say, oh, that's karma, right? He got what he deserves. That's karma. The problem is karma is, you know, bad theology. It's not a real thing. But sometimes we might be tempted to interpret things that way. And that's what I think they were doing here. But here's what I think is at the root of it, why they missed it. They missed what Jesus was up to because they didn't appreciate who he really was in the first place. They knew something of who he was because they'd been with him for this time, right? So, so, and they were following him. They'd given up a lot to follow him. So they weren't like totally unbelievers or anything, but they didn't really have a good appreciation of who he was. It says in verse 52 that they hadn't learned anything from the feeding of the 5,000. And it says later that the hearts were hardened, not in the sense that they were antagonistic to Jesus, not in the sense that they, and that, like we talk about somebody who has a hard heart, we're, we're thinking of something a little more uh, stringent, but I think in the sense that they just hadn't got it yet. The hearts were hardened to the reality of who he was. And isn't that like us? Isn't that like us not to get it, even though we've, we've, we've seen it? I mean, we have something they didn't have. We have the testimony of the New Testament. We have four biographies of Jesus showing him doing all these amazing things. So we know more than they did at that time who he is. And yet, sometimes we're still spiritually slow to understand and appreciate Jesus for who he is. But it's in the distress, in the times of need, that we have an opportunity a unique opportunity to see him for who, who he really is. Because we see in those moments, perhaps better than any other, that he will not abandon us. I don't, um, I don't know how to cook. I don't, I don't cook well at all. Um, but my wife and I like to watch these cooking shows like MasterChef, right? And so I'm learning all kinds of things about cooking that I'll never, ever use. But, um, but it's fun to watch. And one of the things they'll say every now and again is that they'll talk about the flavor profile and they'll say, you know what, you needed something acidic in there to bring out that sweetness or whatever it is. You know, you need something in there. It's, it provides a little bit of contrast so you can really taste that sweetness. And I think that's what these moments of life do for us. When we go through these moments of distress, it, it provides a little bit of a contrast that really brings out the goodness of God in our lives. So look at the outcome. This is where Jesus set them up to get them to this point. Here's the outcome. Understanding and amazement. They come to the place of really understanding what's going on. And as a result, there's an amazement at who Jesus is. I, I don't take verse 52 to mean that they still lacked understanding and their hearts were still hardened. I don't think that's what it means at all. right? I think they got over that as soon as they recognized Jesus on the water. They had an aha moment at that point. But I think verse 52 is telling us why it took them so long to get there. Why did it take them so long to, to understand what was going on and that Jesus had come to save them? Because their hearts had been hardened. But don't overlook their reaction. My translation says they were completely astounded. Other translations say they were utterly amazed. This is a term of worship. It means that they were in awe. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 2, Habakkuk says this, Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. 
in your wrath remember mercy. Well, that, that term in Habakkuk, I stand in awe. When they translated Habakkuk into Greek, the Old Testament's in Hebrew, and they translated it into Greek, it's the same term that Mark uses here when he says they were completely astonished. They were in awe of who Jesus is. Here's my point. Even though there's no singing, there's no choir, there's no preaching, there's no offering. They clearly were not Baptists. There's no offering, right? They were in awe of Jesus. And so there was worship. In fact, Matthew, in his account of this story, makes it more explicit. He says this, Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. You know, sometimes the hard moments of life are the best moments to see who Jesus really is and to worship him. But let's not be like the disciples who didn't learn from the feeding of the 5,000. And my guess, the reason they didn't learn from that, I'm not sure why, but maybe because it wasn't a, a pressing issue in their life. You know, missing a meal, not pleasant, but, but being out in this boat in the water when they thought they were going to die pushed them into a place they hadn't been before. But let's not be like the disciples. Let's practice preemptive worship. Don't wait for God to see how he will provide for you before you worship him. Don't sit back and say, I'm going to wait and see. I'm going through this crisis moment and the jury's still out on what I think about God and all of this. No, no, no. Worship him in anticipation that he will provide what you need when you need it. So in the middle of the storm, in the middle of your distress, in the middle of your crisis, that's when we need to worship Christ. Father, we thank you for this, this wonderful story from the book of Mark, Lord, and and the lesson it teaches us about who you are and who Jesus is in our life. And Father, we are so grateful that you have, you have provided us with this Savior, but you've also provided us with the testimony of who he is in Scripture. And Lord, unlike the disciples, we, we have so much more to look back to, to know who you are so that we can look forward to what you will do in our lives. Lord, we know that you love us because you died on the cross for us. And if you never ever did anything else, we would know that you love us. But Lord, we know you do more than that. You provide for needs, Lord. You provide way beyond what we need in our lives so many times. To the point, Father, sometimes when we do go through a crisis or a difficult time, Lord, we think it's, it's unfair. But Lord, I pray that in those moments we would, knowing who you are and anticipating what you will do, Lord, that we will worship you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.